if I worked on a terrestrial company, I would know what regulations I operate I under. Love that. A terrestrial company? <laughs> oh my gosh! I've never it's heard ice that. space. It's not you a terrestrial company. You have to say that now. Terrestrial company. A terrestrial company. <laughs> Welcome to Star Talk, everyone. This is Star Talk recording live at a Space Sustainability Summit in London. Woo! And yes, it is. Woo! This will be an entire program devoted to space sustainability, and this is nothing I can do on my own. First, I got to bring in my co-host, which is part of the DNA of Star Talk a professional stand-up comedian, and who do we have here? Matt, come on up, Matt. Woo! Matt Winning, is your name, yes? Yeah, my name's Matt Winning. Uh, I, yeah, pleasure to be with you here. Yeah, yeah, come on, we have a seat. Yeah, have a seat. Yeah. Um, it's good to be in London, a city that um, you can't ever see any stars in, so I've <laughs> <laughs> missed most of them my entire life. All right, so Matt is also, uh, He's not only a professional stand-up comedian from Scotland. Yeah. Scotland. Yeah. Uh, he's also uh, an expert in environmental causes. And in fact, your your let me get your full your full uh, CV description cool. here. Um, environmental research fellow yep. at University College London. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And, and you've written a book on this subject. Yeah. It's a comedy book. A comedy. <laughs> yep. Hot mess. Yeah. Hot mess. What on earth can we do about climate change? That is the name of the book. And you birthed this during COVID. I did. I sat in a room for a year while I had a, uh, like a baby. I don't know if you've heard of them. Yeah. I had a baby <laughs> and, and there was COVID, so I couldn't leave the house. And I sat in a room and wrote a book about, uh, I think the world's first comedy book about climate change. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out uh, where that goes in a moment. Let me introduce our, our aerospace engineer panelist. Okay. Uh, first up. We've got Jenna Tawana. Jenna, come on up. So Jenna's an aerospace engineer, and you're also uh, head of business development for iSpace. Not head yet. Oh, <laughs> not head yet. Okay, I'm loving it, I'm loving it there. Uh, uh, business development, so you have an aerospace background, engineering background, yep. but also some business jobs. Yeah, right. And so this is with uh, iSpace, yeah. a Japanese uh, company, yeah. and they do what? What's their one sentence? iSpace is a lunar exploration company, um, headquartered in Tokyo, but has European and American offices. Um, and really, we have a have a view to connect the moon and the Earth as an ecosystem. And I will leave it at that for now. Excellent. So you're going a little beyond where we are now, yeah. worried about low Earth orbit and other yeah. places like that. It's next so big thing. We'll come back to you. Okay, have a seat. And we also have Danielle Wood, an aerospace engineer from MIT. Danielle, welcome. <laughs> Assistant Professor of Aerospace Engineering at MIT and also Director of MIT's Space Enabled Program. We'll ask more about that as, as we come along here. Pleasure to be here with you all. Okay, we will also thank our sponsors, which include for this broadcast. I, I want to thank Privateer Space uh, for this, and uh, of which we just heard from Mori Baja, and also, of course, Omega Watches. Uh, some of you may or may not know, Omega was the first watch on the moon in the Apollo program, and they earned that spot. As I understand it, they did an experiment where they bought all the fancy, expensive Swiss watches and put them in a black box and shaked them and baked them and, and accelerated them and, and, and checked at the end. They opened the box to see who still kept time and Omega did it best. So as I understand it, Omega earned that place in the history of space exploration. We thank, publicly thank Omega for this. Very, very happy to ask what time it is on the moon. What, what's the time zone? Oh, yeah, I don't know. It's time zone is Houston time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, of course, of course. It's Houston time all over the moon. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to begin this program with a, a five-minute clip of a conversation I had with Steve Wozniak, okay? You may have heard of him. Uh, he uh, co-founded a company that... And we're going to make oranges, and they changed it, and they decided instead to make apples. So Steve Wozniak and 
Steve Jobs, co-founders of Apple Computer. Why do I have this conversation with Steve Wozniak? Because he is active in this space. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> he cares about space sustainability. He, uh, uh, and in fact, he's one of the founding members of Privateer. So let's join us in that clip with Steve Wozniak. Five minutes. Woz, you're engaged in this enterprise called Privateer which is all about space. But when people think about space, we're thinking, okay, who's, what rocket are you launching? And is it gonna be suborbital or orbital? Are you gonna go to Mars? Are you gonna terraform? And none of that is, on your, is in your portfolio. So could you please explain to me, what are you doing in space that no one else is doing? First of all, you know, I like yourself get, you know, dozen pitches a day, join our operation, our company, lend your name to it, whatever. And it's just, I'm only one person. I do not live in a big, like, kind of, I have a team world and all that. I'm a company. So I take on very, very few of these. And this one was one I took on largely because of my total, most respect for my best friend, Alex Fielding, our CEO. What we started up for was based around um, Alex, myself, and Moriba Jaw, a professor at UT Austin. Um, he has been an environmentalist about space. And he has been so concerned about, you know, what's going on and where we're going in space and especially this idea of junk. And we want to be starting out. It's like, you've got to know what's there before you can deal with anything. And we want to be a good mapping organization, but we want more than that. We want to form standards and interoperate with other people that have satellites up in space that have good, useful information for those of us on earth. And we want to share it and sort of have um, just standard ways of representing, you know, where things are. And you, first of all, you've got to know where things are to avoid collisions. Is what you're doing then creating a, a landscape, I really I should call it a spacescape. <laughs> Am I allowed? Is that such a, does that word exist yet? Uh, the, the natural evolution of a landscape would be a spacescape. You're creating a spacescape on which future participants in space can make intelligent decisions collaboratively if necessary so that everyone can play in the same sandbox. That is exact. That's a very good way to say it. Yes, exactly. Well, this, this word sustainability, which is a buzzword today in so many sectors, it, we've never heard it used before with regard to space. Could you tell me what that means in space? Well, you know, it's things are growing out of control, out of regulation and what's going up. Uh, it's growing exponentially. The number of launches, the number of of things that we're putting up in, especially near orbit, near Earth orbit. And we just want to, you know, have a, a, an environment where it doesn't become too dangerous to launch the satellites that are so key to our humanness. Well, I, in, in some ways, it's kind of a happy problem to have because it's saying, I mean, when you consider 60 years ago, there was one satellite in orbit or two, and now we have countless thousands, uh, countable thousands. But <laughs> the fact that within 60 Neil, years, it's like- Neil, look what we got from that. Look what we got from that. All of Silicon Valley, I was fortunate to live there and we had a space race going on. And the space race, Lockheed Martin moved into Sunnyvale and Intel started up in Santa Clara. And the need for chips, low, it, it was so, every gram cost so much money to launch into space back in those days that, oh my gosh, if you could make six transistors on one little piece of silicon instead of one piece, six times less the weight. And so we, a lot of great things that humans have now, including our entire digital world, really grew out of that effort to, um, to basically get into space. So yeah, yeah, Waz, that's a very underappreciated fact about te modern technology and how, you know, if it, if it only ever stayed in your living room, why make it any smaller than the furniture that was your radio <laughs> from the 1930s, right? If someone says, I want to put this technology in space, oh my gosh, Silicon Valley, get to work. Well, what I'm delighted to learn, uh, not only about Privateer, but that you and your ambitions and your following, which is huge, and your legacy are all being offered to this mission statement. And uh, you are here at the beginning of something that I'd like to think um, will be properly regulated going forward so that space won't, won't be a scary place to visit. It should be a delight. That That's for would... myself. I, I would not risk my legacy of doing a lot of good things, you know, in my life would not risk it on, you know, a company that wasn't thinking the same way. Danielle, let me come to you. Given your professional profile, 
What does sustainability mean to you? Because we know, at least from terrestrial sustainability with the environment, everyone has sort of a different sense of what that means. So I just want to make sure we don't have to be on the same page. We just want to know what pages are there in this in this uh, in this playbook of sustainability. Thanks so much, Neil. We are in an important era in human relationship to space. Humans are having the ability now to use technology in a way that's letting us influence what happens in the space environment in ways we've never seen before. Part of that is the number of physical objects we put in space. And part of it is the way we change the environment, whether it's in orbit around the Earth or on the moon. So you can think about it historically and think about the number of objects we put in space and also what happens at the end of the mission of a satellite. My first training is in satellite design. So as a satellite designer, as an aerospace engineer at MIT, no one asked me, make sure at the end of the mission of this satellite that you take care to throw out your trash. They just said, make it work. But space sustainability means that as satellite designers and operators and regulators, we check to see that at the end of the operational use of a satellite to monitor the weather or to make sure we have communication systems, that we make sure that the next generation of satellites and those in many years to come can still come. So space sustainability means ensuring that we can keep space a safe operational place for many generations. That makes so much sense. Did no one think about that for 50 years? <laughs> Let's just make a satellite and just, when it stops working, just leave it there. I mean, who's thinking that? Why? Well, there's some physics to keep in mind, right? There's a couple of good things. So one, if you work on a satellite, Let's think about where the space station is, about 400 kilometers, 250 miles above the Earth. If you drop a satellite from there, which sometimes people do, it's not going to be in space too long, fortunately, because there is a nice system where there's a convenient set of uh, particles that are at the top of the atmosphere. Air people, molecules. Some are molecules, some are uh, ionized, because some of them have come apart, and so you got your charged particles, got your molecules, got a few Okay, you got a whole portfolio. A portfolio, yes. Okay. So these particles can, can provide some friction if you're low enough in the, you know, in the altitude. But as you go higher and higher, you know, you have uh, less and less, you have to move into a, a true you know, vacuum. So that's the place where you can so what, what could you have done 40 years ago for a satellite that was above where you have your air molecules and ionized particles to have slowed it down and have it re-enter? This is a great question. You use this phrase, slow it down, the question of deceleration, right? So one question is, are designers of satellites being told you must ensure that you have fuel that's going to give you the option to deorbit. Are they? Are, is that happening? This is a good question. It's not been required. There's well, been it's a, a good question. I don't know if it's happening. <laughs> I think the issue is not. It's not useful question. to say. You know, that's a good question. Where's the answer to that? Right. I'd say it's not happening enough. Meaning, there's been uh, both. Uh, either regulations at the national level or best practices saying it's important to get your satellite out of space within 25 years. Now, the question is, is that enforced by, by national governments and also is other technical challenges that make it hard to do it? So regulation is a, is a missing dimension here. It's there, but it needs to be changed and improved. So Matt, yeah? you're an environment dude. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very much down-to-earth sort of environment dude. Okay, and so sustainability to you who thinks about Earth problems, what does it mean to you? I think it's, to me, sustainability is kind of like gymnastics, right? In the sense that it's very much about balance, and also I like doing it on my high horse while wearing spandex. Really? <laughs> Not so much the spandex, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it, it's, to me, sustainability is basically just thinking beyond today and yourself to think about who's indirectly affected by these things. Think about who's affected by this in space and time, you know, space and time with that space in the Earth or <laughs> space. And uh, yeah, so, so it's sort of long-term thinking, really. Okay, so Doug, before I get back to you here, I just want to, he's talking about how it affects different people. And that's so often a missing cog in a wheel that we build and steer, right? So does satellite technology or the existence of satellites affect different people different ways on Earth? For my PhD, I traveled to a number of countries in Africa, as well as uh, some teams in uh, Middle East and Southeast Asia, and I asked people, why does your country want to have a space program? And all over the world, everywhere I went, every country wants to have the ability to use satellites for national mapping of the environment, making sure they can track floods and, and results after earthquakes, making sure they can have communications as they need it. And right now, there's not equal benefits uh, in countries around the world on how they use space technology, but it's possible to get there especially if we keep asking you know, how countries are going to train their next generation of engineers to know how to design and operate satellites. So it's not just the engineers at the table, there's a geopolitical dimension that needs, uh, needs to be addressed Definitely. as well. Uh, okay, so what does space sustainability mean to you? Or well, one who sees to the moon beyond all the Sees to the moon. <laughs> yes. yeah. um, 
so it's I think it's can span a lot of things really. Um, but sustainability, whether it is space, whether it's business, um, it's really about, as Matt said, thinking about the long term mindset, right? So not focusing on short term gains at the expense of your long term um, gains either. So it's it's really you know looking to the future and thinking how you can do things with a longer term view. Um, and one thing I want to mention is that space by nature is not um, homogeneous. So everyone's not going together. Um, there are some countries that are really emerging. There are some companies that are, you know, have been in space a lot longer. And so we, our definition of sustainability, um, whatever that is, needs to be sustainable for, yes, the space fragmentations now, but also the ones that are yet to come, right? So some people are really at the first early stages of their exciting space journey, and we need to make sure sustainability means for them, not only for the developed nations too. Okay, so you're, to do your job, yep. you need satellite data. Satellites are so important to look at climate change. Okay, so you're in a, in a, in a balancing point here because you, you want as many satellites as you can get up there to help you on the Earth, yet we're trying to regulate how many there might ultimately be. So is there some implosion point? <laughs> There's <laughs> some point where, okay, we, we have balanced this and we can't lean left or right or forward or back because the whole, the whole system will collapse. Maybe we'll get there. We'll fix the Earth, but space will be like, yeah, we can't go there anymore. We've ruined it. Right, but you can't fix the Earth if you don't have the satellite data to help that. Exactly. And too, much sa and too many satellites interferes with the satellite environment. Chicken and egg, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah, it's so important. Well, I mean, the, the egg came first. Oh, yeah. yeah, it was laid by a bird that was not a chicken. We solved that problem. We went on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay? Evolutionarily, it was made by a bird that you wouldn't have called a chicken, and then the egg hatches, and they say that's a chicken. Well, so the egg came first. Well, but what bird? Who cares? <laughs> Whatever bird it was, it was not a chicken. Well, a chicken. <laughs> what? A proto, proto, proto chicken. Proto chicken. Yeah, not a chicken. It was some other bird. I just, so, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, yeah. I just want to fix your chicken egg. Referencing there. The, so yeah. the, the egg came first. Yes. Great. Well, I'm done. <laughs> I think we've solved the big question for today. <laughs> so, so um, tell me about, so, so both of you, and you, you, you have a long view. By the way, I, I'm, I'm totally impressed with your dual background of aerospace engineering and business. Yeah. Right? Because without that, that other piece of this puzzle, there is no meaningful uh industry that you can look to yeah and both sides need to talk to each other and including lawyers and including artists and really everyone it has to include lawyers yeah yeah <laughs> sorry sorry to, sorry to burst that bubble but a space sustainability conference I think we need lawyers man <laughs> uh, space lawyers there's a film there somewhere <laughs> um, <laughs> We need some sort of John Grisham novel set in the moon. See, if they told me that in advance, I would have put a different joke in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, tell me more, just take me uh, back to the moon and that sort of lunar, I guess cis-lunar space is called, right? The space between, between Earth and the moon. Exactly. Um, is any, are any solutions to this problem available to us beyond the three traditional Earth orbits, you know, Leo, Mio, and Geo. Can we just dump garbage on the moon or somewhere? I mean, this is part of the problem because technically right now we should be mindful, but there is nothing telling you you can't. And, you know, we shouldn't. And this is exactly why we need to talk about it because with, you know, with... Earth orbits, we're at this point where it's retrospective. We're trying to fix. We know it's a problem. At the moon, we're at the stage where we're not there yet. So we can do something about it now. You could prefix problems that haven't arisen yet. Yeah, we can be proactive rather than reactive. And that's very rare in the, where you get that instance to, be, to play that role and be in this point of time. Um, and so there should be more moon discussion. <laughs> moon in the house. <laughs> Find a micro, drop it now. Moon in the house. Okay, when I think of the table that people need to sit around to resolve this as we go forward, you know, yes, we, we, we feel like we're a little bit behind the curve, but we don't know how far it would go or could go, so maybe looking back on this, we're here at the right place at the right time. Absolutely. At, at the dawn of the need for this kind of effort. Yeah. But when I think of who's at the table, you're going to have an uh, earth environmentalist person, certainly. You're going to have business people, you have aerospace engineers, 
satellite designers, the physics and the engineering of that. Um, is there someone else you think should be at this table? To I want to express. channel my geologist friends who would tell me the reason we want to dump a bunch of trash on the moon is because the moon is this beautiful, pristine place where there's not a heavy atmosphere, a very limited atmosphere. So what we have is this amazing record of when rocks come through our solar system and like land on the moon. How yeah, beautiful. The record is there forever. It's so, if, if we don't mess it up, if we don't dump all our trash there. Okay. So, so no dumping trash on the moon. So okay. we can enjoy this record, right? It's, it's all this great history. <laughs> but what if you set up like a recycling facility on the moon? Would that be good? I mean, that's a yeah. business idea. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And, and this is it, right? It's, we need to be, rather than just one way of we're going and can't survive the lunar night, so hey-ho, on we go. We need, to, we, have, we need to be able to use what's up there to, to create this, this kind of circular economy. Um, and it's really difficult, and no one's cracked it, but at least we're talking about it. Yeah. So what about other cultures around the world? Uh, do they have seats at the table on this? You know, I spent a long time during the pandemic asking this question. Another chance, like you, you wrote a book. I had conversations <laughs> with indigenous scholars and people who do research on anti-colonial issues to ask the question, for those who have experienced some... Anti-colonial? That's a word. Wow. That's not that's a word. Wow. Okay. Uh, there's a whole scholarship We are here in London. That, that is my... <laughs> global seats of okay. colonization and okay. imperialist okay. mindset. Okay. And European <laughs> colonization in two sentences. Is that yours? <laughs> it's mine now. Let's <laughs> get home museums. <laughs> Yeah, so, so what do they, they can have, what would their seat at the table do? I sat and listened for hours, and you can join me because it's all available to you online. We recorded it. We sat and listened on Zoom uh, to indigenous elders talk about the fact that many cultures, we'll start with those in the North American region, consider not just the physical earth, but also the moon and parts of space as part of their sacred heritage, a place where they have responsibility to care. And there's an interesting story that's a, a bit sad, but also a lesson for us in the 1990s. Uh, we lost one of our astronomers, uh, somebody who we wanted to honor, and the NASA was interested Can you in... you mention the name? Who, who, who was it? Uh, yes, I'm just going to have a, a mental... I'll come back to you in a second. Well, well, that was your secret way of saying I forgot the person's name. Let me keep talking. I, mean, and I, just I was going to do it really you. smoothly. I was going to pull it in. Okay, go ahead. Thank you for finding my mistakes. It's excellent. Uh, this is Shoemaker. So we lost Shoemaker. Uh, and NASA wanted to put the ashes on the moon. Oh, so, oh Eugene Shoemaker. Yeah. Okay, just a quick background on him. Thank you. Uh, he was one of the early geologists to identify that <laughs> the Barringer Crater in Arizona was, in fact, of meteoric origin. This is a well, the, perhaps the best preserved crater on Earth's surface for all the reasons cited that um, most craters, Earth would look like the moon were it not for erosion and all the other terrestrial forces that erase the history of these collisions. He was one of the first to recognize that that was an impact crater. And in fact, he was slated to be the geologist to fly on Apollo 17. And I think they found some kind of heart murmur with him. And so they sent another geologist instead. But he and his wife, Carolyn Shoemaker, and David Levy were big uh, comet and asteroid hunters. And they've discovered many, many comets and asteroids. Uh, one of them, they gifted to me in my name. So I actually have an asteroid, asteroid 13123 Tyson, discovered by the Shoemaker and Levy uh, Perry. So, so when he died, they said, let's send it more to the moon. Okay, so is that what they did? They did, indeed. They did. And of course, you know, there's a beautiful story that he couldn't go personally, and I'm sure he was honored. Well, he missed out on his chance. Missed out, right? Yeah. So because of that, the family really wanted to honor him. So this was done, and it was done through a lander. But the interesting next done, step... Not through a lander. Uh, done through a lander. Oh, so it landed, and so it didn't um, smash into the moon. No, one of the goals was for the ashes to be you know, on, on a safe mission. But the next step of the story... But the ashes? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want the ashes to burn up? They're already ashes. <laughs> they, 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 were, they were safely interred. Okay. Fine. But the next step of the story is um, a public letter written by the president of the Navajo Nation in the U.S., who, his name's Albert Hale, who says, um, we understand that this is you know, done to honor this important you know, astronomer and scientist, but uh, I wish that you had asked for consultation on this, because many Native communities, in ours in particular, but others, uh, hold the moon as sacred, and objects that represent death uh, actually violate our understanding of what, what's, what's sacred on the moon. I want to give appreciation to a student of mine named Alvin Harvey, who's also from the Navajo Nation, who's uh, done studies on this and, and given me the knowledge I have about it. But just to say that 
it's a conversation worth having to say if there's cultural differences uh, in how we view what, what it means to honor someone on the moon, at least uh, doing it publicly is a great way to start. So it's the opposite of colonialism. The office of colonialism is actually asking people what they care about and value, <laughs> <laughs> and then listening to their answer. Okay, interesting. So uh, let me not speak for them, but speak for what I think they might. I don't think it even occurred to them to ask. I, I don't see it as something malicious that they did. It just, we need people such as yourself to open that dialogue and sensitize people. Um, Where would you like your ashes scattered? I want to be buried so that I am consumed by the flora and fauna of which I have dined upon for my entire life for my sustenance so that I can return my body to the earth. You had that prepared. <laughs> <laughs> and you want that on? Do you want that written on the gravestone as well? Because yeah, no, we might need a pretty big <laughs> gravestone for all of that. Just give me back to the earth. Okay. So I don't want my ashes scattered anywhere. Anywhere. Okay. Yeah, there. There it is. Um, when I think of environments and stability and, and uh, access points, there are also these sort of magic places in a two-body orbiting system, uh, the Lagrange points, where the net sort of force of gravity and centrifugal forces balance out. And we put the James Webb Space Telescope in one of those uh, orbits. Uh, it's the Earth-Sun L2 point, so it's like a million miles opposite the direction of the sun. And when you put a satellite there, it kind of hangs out without requiring much uh, sustaining, uh, much in the matter of fuel to sustain as well. So it's a balance point. And so uh, are, is this a factor in any of this conversation about sustainability at all? Because they're kind of magic points in space. I mean, I'd like to know maybe they can be exploited in some clever way. I think it's both a, a strength and weakness. Because one question is, are we going to end up seeing a lot of popularity in those sites? Probably so. I think mm -hmm. it's going to make sense as people are asking what ways do you want to sort of have systems working on the moon? We ask you a question, how do you have logistics to make sure you can provide facilities? And one could be to have some facilities you know, operating around Lagrange points. And the question is, how do we share them? Right, because any other place is just unstable and will fall in or have to orbit and track it, track where it is. So I bet they're going to be very attractive going forward in the future. Yeah, and because of that, they should be seen as a finite resource and they should be thought about sustainably and how we can operate in, the, in them sustainably, like for sure. They, they should be seen as finite, in my opinion. Okay. And so they're multiple. So there's Lagrangian points, there's Earth and Moon Lagrangian points, there are five of them, and Earth Sun Lagrangian points. So anything that orbits, uh, you can find these five spots. And, and they're very cool, and they can even collect debris. So for example, the Sun Jupiter Lagrange points, mm -hmm. right? There are places in front of Jupiter and behind it in its orbit, which are two of the Lagrange points. They have just collected meteors. So you look behind Jupiter and in front of it to those, and there's like, trailing meteors just hanging out there because all the forces enable that yeah and so it's been suggested that in one of these places you could just put all of your engineering materials if you want to build something just leave it there it's like your storage closet because it's not going to fall to any place else and then later on you bring in all the assemblers and they put it together so then maybe this should be considered you're the moon person put that on your i'm not a sun jupiter person though. <laughs> But no, I think that I think that makes sense, and um, you know, there, I think it's all about also transferring lessons learned, right? So as we learn to work um, in an environment which is heavily cluttered and Leo, and how we kind of navigate away from debris, that that technology, that thinking can be used to, if we do want to operate in these Lagrange points with lots of meteorites, how to navigate that field. So really, it's just about bridging the lessons learned in space on a lot of different fronts. Okay, so something we haven't directly addressed because we've been speaking of satellites that were on purpose put there and maybe then lived out their useful life. So what about debris? The fact that three satellites, last I checked, have been destroyed in orbit uh, by different countries. China, I think, did it first. We did it second. And Russia, I think, did it recently. And this uh, is a demonstration, perhaps. Uh, but in any case, it's, it is itself polluting the environment, making all activities dangerous. So I'm just wondering, what uh, what solution do you have to clean up the, the debris? This is a good question. In three sentences, what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> well, first I'll just say that uh, countries need to commit to no more anti-satellite tests. That's just needed. We need to have that be a global sense of peer pressure across all countries. Uh, that's a geopolitical solution. On the engineering side, it is exciting that we're seeing capabilities. We've got folks in the room who are working directly on missions 
and to do different forms. But just to be clear, the anti-satellite test is euphemism for let me blow my satellite into a zillion pieces. Well said. We should, we should clarify what we mean. So these are tests where country A says, I'm going to blow up my own satellite to prove that if I needed to, I could blow up yours. We're not going to do that right now. Oh, they don't say that. They don't say We're going to blow up our own satellite just to, to see if we can do it. Can but do but it. I want you to watch as we do that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You better be paying attention. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it, it seems like a very childish thing to do as a sort of threat. It's like, I'm just going to punch myself in the face. <laughs> and I hope you guys are paying attention because I could punch you in the face too, but my face is going to be too sore for me to do that. We're going to have to use the money to, re, you know, fix my face. And, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if, if that really works. But there's a difference between knocking out a satellite in low Earth orbit and in a higher Earth orbit, right? Mm -hmm. So what's that? I mean... But don't all the particles just fall back out and burn up? I mean, I think you should ask them. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't they? Again, it depends on some physics. We got to see uh, altitude here. And we also want to ask, you know, how popular the altitude is where the original satellite was, right? And what else is, is between the original satellite and all the pieces it needs to come down past? So. I saw the movie Gravity. Oh, okay? I'm sorry. <laughs> Which should be called Zero Gravity because it was all in zero gravity. But in that movie, they showed this catastrophic failure of all satellites because one satellite was blown to bits. And each of those bits moving at 18,000 miles an hour. Sorry, I'm American. What's, what's that in? Oh, no. Miles, we're in the UK. Well, yeah, miles. miles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Vented miles. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> so 18,000 18, uh, miles an hour. These are now debris moving at 18,000 miles an hour that they can take out other satellites. And in that film, if you haven't seen it, the movie Gravity, you gotta get out, by the way, if you haven't. You know, <laughs> just, uh, that it, it portrays a total satellite uh, collapse of the entire system, uh, which was, uh, was named after somebody, um, the Kessler effect, I think. Uh, so, so I love Sandra Bullock and I love Gravity. I just have to note that the, the Hubble is not the same altitude as the International Space Station, <laughs> for those who pay attention. So yeah, yeah, so she, story. yeah, yeah, so, so Sandra Bullock, her character, they ju she just decides to go fix the Hubble telescope on the <laughs> mission. Right. Yeah, but they're like hundreds of miles apart in altitude. Plus, she was a medical doctor, so I wanted to keep her hands off my telescope. <laughs> As an astrophysicist, I don't bust into her operating room and say, uh, open heart surgery? I got this. I'm an astrophysicist, right? I don't know. No. I think that we had a good message, but maybe, you know, some of the physics was uh, simplified. But the point, of course, is that, you know, we do want to ask, you know, how other pilots are affected by, by the breakup of one satellite. That's really and I'm just asking, what do you do about the debris? You all don't have those solutions yet? Oh, you got a solution. Matt's got a solution. No, I'm going to have to bring up another movie right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> because uh, one of the, the best and most atrocious movies you will ever see is about satellites in space trying to solve climate change. It's called Geostorm. Geostorm! And okay, but the lead actor is, was from Scotland. Yeah, Jared so the, right, Just to be clear, yeah. the lead actor is from Scotland, and so is Matt. So he might be a little biased here. Well, he lives in Los Angeles and his house burned down due to fires in Los Angeles and he still lives there and doesn't live in our hometown anymore because it's better to live somewhere that's on fire than where I come from. Um, where I'm from, uh, Paisley. Just outside of Glasgow. Just outside Glasgow. It, was, it went up for uh, the UK City of Culture 2020 and lost to Coventry. <laughs> um, which gets a laugh in the room. It's the equivalent of going up for an Academy Award and losing to Gerard Butler. Wow. <laughs> Some Butler fans in today. Anyway, the point is... Blood drawn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blood drawn, okay. The, 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 um, the, it's about... He, he invents uh, a satellite that controls the climate and it fixes climate change. And then some terrorists hijack that satellite... Yeah, and start messing with the climate and there's storms and stuff. And the only guy that can solve it is Gerard Butler. He goes into space. Turns out it was the uh, vice president that had controlled it. So yeah, I've given away the spoilers there. But <laughs> point is, one of the greatest films of all time and really don't spend your time watching it is Geostorm. It's about satellites, climate change, you know. Interesting. So this is a... a, a uh, that's not a let's clean things up solution. Let's let us uh, fix things uh, with what we call geoengineering. Geoengineering, exactly. Right. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Right. Which again, I mean, we're not going to get agreement 
Oh, and I joke about this, you know, we have acid rain, and so is the solution, let's give everyone acid rain proof umbrellas. You know, is that really the solution <laughs> to fixing the acid rain problem? I mean, some people would say yes. People that sell acid, that invent acid rain proof umbrellas would be like, yeah, we've got a solution here for you guys. We let's should, go we should back do to this. the question we were talking about, Sorry. which is, you know, do we reduce space debris by like creating less debris or by trying to clean up the debris that's already there? I think we need to do both. And some of the ideas people have for cleaning up the debris that's there are to send another satellite that can hopefully go grab it, whether it's you know, through a, a hook or through a, a forceful docking. So I think one question I have is, as we build new satellites, can we design them to be serviced so they can actually be ready? Right, so if I set up a satellite that can sweep up debris, I can send a satellite to sweep up your satellite. Yeah. It is a question, that, uh, yeah, another okay. geopolitical question. It's like bowls. It's like you're trying to knock the other bowl out of the thing. Do you have that game in the US? <laughs> bowls? You mean, like, oh, you mean bocce ball? Is bocce ball? What is that? Curling. 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 Yeah, exactly. It's, curling. it's like curling, but, but, but in space, space curling. Space curling. <laughs> <laughs> New Olympic sport. <laughs> um, so, so like, are we going to slowly land this plane that we're flying right now? But let me get some sort of uh, reflections on this. Uh, what have we learned so far that we can take as a, as a, as a bit of wisdom? I don't, even, I don't even call it advice. Just a bit of wisdom going forward for all parties at the table. What should we be doing? So I think for for me, you know, being in a company that's sending things to the moon, and as Danielle rightly mentioned, we shouldn't be dumping things. Um, the fact that if I worked on a terrestrial company, I would know what regulations I operate I under. Love that. A terrestrial company. <laughs> oh my gosh. I've never it's heard ice that. It's not we a space. We have to say that now. Terrestrial company. A terrestrial company. Oh, so if I worked beautiful. for a terrestrial company, okay. so I would. So everyone today works in a terrestrial company. <laughs> Well, it, if you're going to the yeah, if you're going to the moon and space, and I would say no, you're going to you're working for oh, space okay. company. Yeah, I love that. Okay, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, all good. Um, so I, if I worked for a terrestrial company, every time I say that now, I'm going to think of you. Um, if I worked for a terrestrial company, I would know what regulations I need to operate under, um, what assessments I need to do to make sure I'm compliant. Go find my handbook, make sure whatever, whatever. By the way, all of those compliances. Are written. We've got lawyers in the room. We're written because something went wrong. Yeah. Every line in a contract, in a document, was not known prior to the problem that caused the line to be written in the first place. But this is it. For the moon, we know that we need to be delicate. Okay. We know that. So we need to. As I'm in business development, people approach me saying, "I want to take this payload to the moon." I have no assessment. I have nothing I can pick up and be like, hey, this is going to, should we, shouldn't we? This is the, this is the analysis. This no is the, Nothing. No regulations that are very translatable to the day-to-day. -day. For me, the best thing we can do is normalize that, bring that in. And it's very unusual for a company wanting to be regulated, um, but it, it needs to be because we have, we should have responsibility and accountability for what we send up there. It is that, that would include moments. satellite design that said when this runs its useful life, yeah. We have fuel to deorbit it, or yeah. for it to self-destruct, or disappear, or whatever is the magic future physics that could affect the health of the satellite. Yeah, definitely. And, and tell me about this Eagle document you co-authored. What is that? Yeah, so um, as part of the Space Generation Advisory Council, um, led by Antonino Salmeri, which is a space lawyer, actually, sat there. <laughs> um, the is that on your business card? <laughs> yeah. Space yeah. lawyer. That's yeah. badass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that works. Go to the island of space. And you said that's a movie that we have to make. Space right? Wars. That's right. Oh, you know what? You're leave. You're hired. You're direct to it. <laughs> Um, so it was meant to put together a perspective on lunar governance from the younger generation. So right now, lunar governance is very fragmented. Um, we saw that. We went and spoke to lots of different actors playing in the industry that has a view. Um, and we tried to put together the young person's perspective on what we, what we want to see in the world. And that is, the output of that was a lunar governance charter building upon the Outer Space Treaty. So we're not trying to recreate the wheel. We're trying to build into something implementable. The Outer Space Treaty, if you haven't read it, it's a interesting document from 1967, somewhere around. Yeah, this is it. I can't pick it up and know what to do from the Outer Space Treaty in my day-to-day -day job. Yeah, yeah. So I'd recommend you read it. It's just a fascinating attempt to think about the future, realizing that space was being born yeah. in, in that decade. Yeah, and it's for states, yeah. Um, yes. for the public sector. So private needs its own, its own thing. 
Yeah. So uh, just give me some, some reflective thoughts about where we should go in the future. I'm really excited to announce that at this conference, we are opening up and launching tomorrow an, an important initiative called the Space Sustainability Rating. Wait, who's we? Uh, we is a group of uh, organizations that have come together in a consortium led by the World Economic Forum, including MIT, uh, UT Austin, a company called Bryce Tech, the European Space Agency, and we're really excited to have uh, the EPL Space Center, EPFL Space Center, which is in Switzerland. Uh, what does EPL stand for? EPFL, it's, if I can do my French. Oh, it's in French, okay. That, that. My French isn't great, but it, it's the uh, Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Leçons. Anybody can? Oh, nice. All right, not too Very bad. Good. All right, I got it, not too bad. Very good. And in English, it would just be, you know, a, a technical university in Leçons. But they are going to lead this initiative with the support of our design team. We actually do have, uh, particularly for low Earth orbit and for Earth orbit in general, a set of guidelines, which are the actions that any space operator can take and to help reduce space debris creation and help avoid collisions. And so it's a, a long list of, of options uh, for the design phase, the operations phase, and the end of life for practices that can help. And we're asking companies to voluntarily get rated, to pay to get rated, and to announce the rating to the world to say how close they are to matching these ideal practices. This is like the LEEDS rating on a building. Definitely it's rating. And even though it's, it's, it was just the government didn't require this, it becomes a sort of a voluntary thing. And then the public is trained to look for that right. for uh, buildings they might move their business into or even just live in. You can walk into a building and say, this you know, owner of this building chose to pay a little extra money to have you know, the green practices for Earth. And so now, since we're not a terrestrial company, we're asking for companies <laughs> and do the same thing. Both companies and governments can get rated. And I can say this, every Leeds building I've been in, I've noticed that the air smells clean. In it. And that makes me wonder, what the hell am I breathing in the other building? <laughs> <laughs> and now you'll notice that your satellite data smells cleaner because it's going to come from these SSR rated emissions. Uh, so Matt, yeah. you want satellites to help you monitor what's happening on Earth, so you are their enemy. I, yeah, we want satellites, but we just want you to also, yeah, just clean up your satellites after yourselves when you possibly can. But we need it. We, we need, so satellites look at greenhouse gas emissions, which, you know, methane emissions, we, we can now look at what's happening across the entire world and a bunch of oil and gas companies are leaking methane here and there. We can spot that. We can look at, you know, what what's happening in newer satellites. So methane is Scottish for methane. Methane. It's like you had some new element <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. uh, we're going to talk about aluminum in a minute. Oh, God. Aluminium. Aluminium. Um, <laughs> let's, not, let's, get, let's not get into it. Um, it so it's incredibly important. W one reason is that, that methane is uh, <laughs> a short-lived greenhouse gas. Do you, do you see the word gas? Yeah, yeah cool. I, I mean, you actually call what you put in your car's gas, which is nonsense because it's a liquid. <laughs> anyway. Gasoline. Oh, yeah. yeah. You should have thought of that, shouldn't you? Okay. Um, so, yeah, we look, m methane is a short-lived lived gas. So actually, you know, um, CO2 is sort of the, the main gas that we, we emit that's causing climate change. Methane causes m more in the short term. And just to be um, clear, it's short-lived because it's highly reactive right. with other things in the environment, whereas CO2 is a pretty stable molecule. Correct. Okay, okay. That the makes chemistry sense. of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so some people think we need to focus more on CO2. Others think we need to focus more on methane. But, you know, the gas is always greener on the other side. Okay, oh. so uh, it's one of the worst jokes you'll ever hear about climate change, but very accurate. Yeah, um, and totally accurate. But you, you still want your satellite data, but you're with everyone. We're not going to believe we're going to stop launching satellites. We just have to manage that going forward. Exactly. In, in a way that we can all... Yeah, we, it, it's helping the Earth. You know, more satellites are helping the Earth. But yeah, as, as we, you know, we need to be forward thinking about well, what are the issues going to be caused in, in space because of it. So, so uh, I just want to say uh, thank you, panel, for those uh, observations. I want to share with you what I would call a cosmic perspective on all this. Uh, it's not a new problem that technology, engineering forces operate on civilization in ways that make life better. And we only later learn what kinds of constrictions it has placed on our health, our wealth, our security, and all of those matter in space, of course. So um, I'd rather view this not as, a, not as some dire problem, but as a natural course of evolution of what happens when you become better at something that you ever, than you ever imagined. And so now you deal with it. And I'm delighted to see and learn that not only is such a conference as this something that's happening now, 
not in 10 years. Imagine if this conference were held 50 years ago when we first started using plastic in major ways for containers, for food containers and other applications. Just imagine, because at the time it's plastic. Use it once, throw it away. Where does it go? No one thought about that. Okay, it works its way into the oceans, okay? And now, last I read, the fish we eat are 50% plastic. Isn't that correct, Matt? <laughs> I, I, I think it's something like that. There's now, I think, something around twice the weight of all of the animals on the earth in plastic. In plastic is in the ocean. Uh, just the accumulated total, we have sort of like twice the entire weight of all mammals or something yeah, like that. Yeah, okay. It's insane. And uh, another data, I'm just uh, informed by my crack team of researchers, mm -hmm. that the weight of a credit card's worth of plastic uh, might be found in larger fish that are fished on the ocean. So, no one was thinking this at the dawn of that era. But the fact that that did happen that way, I think has informed how responsible we need to be going forward now. And so, in that way, it's a silver lining to our short-sightedness of the past. But it's only a silver lining if, in fact, we can look to the past and learn from it so that our descendants can be proud of what we have bequeathed them rather than embarrassed by what we have left them. Mm -hmm. so that's a cosmic perspective for this sustainability conference. Thank you all for...